This is MJ. I love Tokusatsu, and right now I want to talk about Common Rider episode two. So this is uh, MJ loves Toku number fifty-seven. Uh, we'll see when zero one gets back, but for now, uh, until there are new episodes, I'm just going to be covering the original Common Rider because I just find the show so so darn compelling. I'm um, entitling this one "Let Me Be the Last Victim of Shocker," which is a quote from Takeshi Hongo, our hero, Common Rider number one, and. I want to start off first by talking about the credits for the episode. So uh, I ended up reaching out. I don't know if, if you listened to the last episode, you will recall that I reached or that I noticed a discrepancy in the credits. So I reached out to uh, a couple of people, Tom Constantines, uh, who works with, uh, is, do they call it the Tokusatsu Network? I think it's what they call it. He lives in Japan. Um, he was involved in... Uh, grown ups in spandex. Uh, he was actually featured in the Rewa movie. Uh, I can't remember if I, I mentioned him in my uh, analysis of that or not, but anyway, uh, like that was pretty darn cool. The Kamen Raider Generations Rewa, the first whatever. Anyway, he was in that as one of the Freedom Fighter type people, and he's been a background character in uh, you know, crowd scenes and things like that before. And anyway, he's a stunt guy. Seems like a pretty cool guy. Anyway, so he uh, answered, and he just basically responded with the Japanese wiki, which I've always been too intimidated to uh, look into. But um, fortunately, you know, the evil company Google, um, <laughs> uh, who's spying on us and supporting the government, whatever, the government we elected. Um, anyway, uh, they uh, have Google Translate, and I actually use that to find information on who did what on these episodes. So... Uh, we have uh, a screenplay credit, and we have a directed by credit, and there's some other information I don't quite understand or, or know what it means, uh, like the audience ratings, and there's a Gito uh, category in this, which I don't know what that means. Uh, and apparently uh, there were some episodes that were produced uh, in one order but aired in another order, which I find to be super interesting. So uh, anyway, without further ado... Uh, this Batman episode, or um, terrifying Batman episode, was written by uh, Masaru Inoue, uh, who wrote the first three episodes, actually. Actually, episode one, episode two, and episode production order four and broadcast order three, which is kind of funny. Uh, and then uh, the director for the first episode was Kuichi Takamoto, according to the Japanese wiki here, and uh, Itaru Orita who I think I had credited in the last episode, but I don't know for sure. Anyway, uh, that's who wrote and directed this. Um, I don't know what else to say. I do just want to try to give credit uh, where it's due and be as accurate as I possibly can with that. And I'll probably just go ahead and keep up with this uh, because I think, it's, uh, I think it's good and I think it's interesting. And I think the more correct information out there, the better. Um, because I do, I don't know, I like accuracy and, and the truth, and I don't know, maybe there's a measure of pedantry there, but it doesn't matter because uh, I like it, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and this segment next episode will be much shorter because I won't have to do all this, uh, I don't know, wind up to it. Anyway, moving on from there, uh, I have made myself a guide for exactly what I should talk about. Um, I have a bunch of cool images saved. Uh, I selected, I... I Took more screen grabs than I'm going to use uh, in the course of this uh, review. Uh, and those select like six or so will be up on the blog of jmunoz.com. So you can check those out there, uh, whether you're just listening to this or uh, if you're actually uh, watching the video version of this. So without further ado, let me go ahead and get into it. Uh, first of all, spoilers, whatever. Uh, I really like this episode. I really like Common Raider. I find it super compelling and... I don't know, two episodes in, that, that doesn't change. And the truth of the matter is, I originally watched, back in the day, like the first uh, 25 or 30 episodes. I remember a Flying Squirrel, which was like friggin' awesome. Anyway, we'll get to that one day. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, <laughs> going back to it again years later, like eight, nine years later, uh, maybe even 10 years later, heck, I don't know, uh, it's still just as good as it was then, and I find it compelling, and uh, I'm going to talk about why. So... I guess first, before that, before I talk about, well, in the course of talk, discussing all these things, I will discuss why I find this show to be so compelling. So I have a couple questions. First is, uh, is this show a horror, a thriller, a mystery, an adventure, or a tragedy? I can't quite tell. Uh, it might be all of them. 
It might be all of them simultaneously. It might switch off between them uh, depending on... I know this was written by the same person. Uh, depending on... I'm not sure what, but it might switch off. And I find that to be interesting. And the reason I asked those questions, so I'm saying horror, thriller, mystery, adventure, tragedy. Uh, we do have elements of all of those things here. So Hongo being sad about um, being a cyborg now and no longer being a human. Uh, there are elements of tragedy there. He didn't choose this for himself. Uh, I don't... To me, there's no like character flaw that you can see in him or identify in him that caused him to be chosen by Shocker. I mean, it's his innate IQ, uh, which, you know, he's a really smart guy, and his great athleticism, which were, you know, got him to be chosen by Midori Kawa uh, to be, uh, a you know, Shocker cyborg, and, you know, that's no fault of his own. So, uh, this guy's just living his happy life, being a good person, doing good things, and then he's taken and victimized by this group. So, you know, there's a tragic element there. So, uh, but then there's stuff like the way that he kills the, well, I mean, two, the horror aspect would be twofold. Uh, you have these, I don't know, are these called Dutch angles where they're, I really should just look up what that means and, and look for some screenshots or, or images or scenes with examples of them. Cause I don't know what that means. And I hear people use them like authoritatively and I'm not pretending to be that, um, not that other people are pretending, just I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to come humbly to this stuff. Anyway, uh, you have you know these weird side angles. You've got the creepy you know vampire or bat makeup on people with the big fangs poking out of their mouths. Uh, you have the so uh, the horror elements like this whole apartment full of people has been turned into vampires or you know bat people by this bat kaijin, and that's pretty creepy. Uh, pretty scary. I, you know, there are horror elements in that. Um, let me see. So, you know, there's also mystery elements. So, Ruriko and her friend, uh, is it Himori? I can't remember what her friend's name is. Sorry. Anyway, Ruriko and her friend are investigating Hongo because she still believes that Takeshi Hongo murdered her father, and she wants to find some proof about it. And, uh, it's funny, I'm, you know, mentioning all these disparate elements, uh, and I guess she's she's got, like, the B-plot going on here, but they all blend together so well. It's just, it's really interesting how it's being written and the idea that, um, I mean, I don't know. It's silly. Uh, no, I'm not wading into any online debates. Um, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, I don't care about Toku uh, community drama all I care about is the content itself because it's so good and anybody can read anything out of it that they want depending on who they are and uh, what perspective they're coming from so I'm not gonna give into that um so horror thriller oh uh there's uh I guess the thriller aspects of it would be like the skulking uh we've got this you know tight POV kind of thing where um Ruriko comes up on Tachiban and knocks him out and uh I think too. Um, well, I guess that maybe that's the only real thriller thriller aspect of it. The like you don't know who's behind necessarily. It, I mean, there's that voyeuristic aspect again uh, that I had mentioned last episode, which is way pared down this time. Like I think this example where she hits him with the vase is really the only example of that voyeuristic um, first person perspective of the camera. Uh, being utilized in a way to add tension and drama to how the person viewing, uh, how the first person in that scene is uh, is viewing and acting and doing things. And I didn't have as much the claustrophobic feel like this is the tightest it ever got. And maybe uh, when we're you know seeing this guy, <laughs> you know, peeking his face through a door, like it's a real tight shot. It you know there's a lot of shadow there, and you know it does have creepier elements to it. But like all of that was a lot more toned down this episode. But also, the Batman here wasn't uh, creeping as much as the Spider-Man was. I mean, his agents more were uh, these people who he had uh, been able to mind control. And, you know, it's interesting that it's a different flavor. It's a different tack. Um, and I appreciate the different perspective. I remember, uh, you know, the there's, you know, kind of a trope from the more modern... Conrader and Super Sentai that there's 
kind of uh, there's victory flags like like mentioned in a keeper ranger that like oh this happened all right now you know victory for the heroes is going to be triggered uh, because we're at this point and you know it'll happen one of three ways or whatever typically it's just one way it's you know giant sword or uh, you know giant spin attack or whatever um, for those in you know in common rider it's the rider kick or a shot or you know a slash or whatever that, that's been the more modern thing uh, but it's interesting in this episode specifically uh, he just uh, he just throws you know just like he throws the regular shocker common men off the roof and kills them he throws the <clears throat> flying Batman off of the roof and he leaves a gigantic smush of blood or splatter of blood on the screen and it's kind of gross and uh, also kind of uh, I don't know again that's like the horror element but then again maybe that's just good plain adventure fun because our hero is becoming victorious over you know the villains that he's facing I'm not sure but I find the blend of genres like super fascinating uh, to see because I just I didn't really expect to see that, and I didn't remember that it was so. I just thought of this over the years as oh, this is Tokusatsu, it's Common Rider, like that's all that matters. But like no, it's a whole blend of a lot of different things, and I find that interesting. So I think I'm ready to put that issue to bed for now. Um, <laughs> Sorry, every time I see this, I think of that little tune. I love this Ishinomori drawing, too. So, so cool. Anyway, so uh, the next question I had while watching this episode or, or thinking about it afterwards is, is it wrong to lie to the devil? Now, uh, I love this question of morality. Uh, recently, uh, somebody reminded me of, in Common Rider Wizard, how he lied Oh, at one point, spoilers for Wizard, minor, minor spoilers. In order to save somebody, he lies to them and leaves them with the impression that somebody who they care about is safe and sound and that they'll probably never see them someday, but maybe, maybe, maybe they could if they decided to go very far away and seek them out. But that kind of like, hey, this person is, you know, alive and well and happy over here. You'll never see them again, even though he had, uh, well, let's just say they were no, they were permanently indisposed and that they were never going to be able to see them again, ever, in their lives, um, except for maybe in the hereafter. And uh, I liked that. There was something charming to me about that. And I think it's interesting. I think honesty is always the best policy, but, uh, and you may think this is hypocritical, uh, you know, why can't you lie to the devil? You know, is it wrong? I don't think it is. Um, I even think little lies to uh, people for the sake of peace are okay uh, as long as they're rooted in truth you know um, but that's just me and you can argue with me all you want about that later uh, if you want to um, I'd be happy to have the philosophical you know, I don't want to argue I'd like to have a full philosophical discussion and discuss the full ramifications of that kind of idea but that being said if we don't want to lie to good people are we okay with lying to the devil I think that's something really interesting and the reason I ask is, uh, if it's okay to lie to the devil is because Hongo actually does that in this episode. Um, and I absolutely love it. Uh, let me find my reference for the scene. So, yeah, the Batman is saying, you know, behold, the virus is gradually taking her over. And Hongo knows all about this virus because he studied it at Jonan University where he used to work. I don't know if he's still working there or not. It seems like no, but then again, we'll get into that later. He has a colleague help him with it, and he figures out that this is an intelligent virus um, being spread by the Batman, uh, set up by Shocker, and it takes over people and anyway, turns them into a mob and whatever. So Batman tells Hongo that um, like he's willing to trade his life for her, maybe, um, and Hongo says to him, if you can prove that it will save her, I'll do whatever you ask. That's the lie. Then the Batman proves that it can save her, and he says that the he shows that the serum is in his body, because uh, he's like, hey, we already have a serum. I could cure her right now. And he said he calls up one of his guys uh, through the mind control, and uh, he cures him, and then Hongo gets this evil or like. This, this great devilish smile on his face and he says, ah, I see the serum is in your body. So the implication from Hongo is I'm just going to tear up your body. I'm going to destroy you, which I was going to do anyway. And then I'm going to save her and I'm going to save all these people. I see no 
moral wrong in that? Uh, like, why should you have to reveal the truth to your enemy, to someone who's trying to kill people? Do you, do you get what I'm saying here? Um, and again, I would lo- I would definitely welcome a long moral, you know, conversation and discussion and debate about, you know, what is the wrong and what is the right here. Uh, but I think Hongo definitely did, he did the utilitarian right thing, but I also think he did the morally acceptable right thing. Uh, I don't think it's a problem to lie to somebody who's an enemy, necessarily. So, although, you know, I'd, I'd love to really expand the way uh, I think about things and be challenged on that. So if you have anything compelling, I, I'd absolutely love to hear it. Anyway, uh, one of the things that this makes me think of, though, is that, um, and this came up in the Rewa movie, and this has come up a lot in you know, the history of Common Rider, especially in movies with big flaming, you know, writer ones, uh, you know, the power of Kamen Rider is said to be an evil power. The power of Kamen Rider comes from evil. Obviously, he was created by Shocker to be one of their, you know, super Shocker um, troopers who, or I guess super troopers, whatever, uh, these super powerful cyborgs who can infiltrate and, uh, you know, one day use their martial strength, their physical might, um, which is that much greater than that of humans, to overtake and uh, to do this coup, basically, for world domination. But his mind was supposed to have been changed. He's supposed to be this mindless drone. But now we obviously know that he uses that power for good. And I kind of enjoy the fact that he's willing to delight in uh, the stuff that he does to Shocker, at least at this point. Um, he's probably in uh, a kind of revenge. I don't know if Hongo's actually in like a revenge type phase right now. I think he's just acting to save people. And... Um, Tachibana even mentioned something about how they won't let Shocker steal people's freedoms because the idea is that this virus is going to do that. It's going to take away people's ability to be free to choose how they want to live, what they want to do with their lives. And, uh, you know, I really love that. I, I, I love the, like, raw base uh, ethic of Common Rider that, like, I just, I will protect people's freedom and I will protect them from Shocker. And people, you know, Shocker is the agency or the, the, organization that's trying to, you know, strangle freedom for humanity, and they're trying to do it through fear and terror and all these other things, and, you know, Kamen just refuses to stand against that, um, or refuses to stand for that, so he does stand against it, that's what I meant to say, but anyway, getting back to my, shoot, <laughs> sorry, getting back to my point, um, about this, like, devilishness in Hongo, like, he really looks like he's excited to destroy this guy, and that he's found the solution to help these people, and uh, I don't necessarily mind him taking delight in being uh, tricky and in foiling Shocker's plans. I, in fact, I kind of like that aspect of him where, like, there's this little edge of darkness that, like, yeah, I am going to destroy you and I'm going to do it with a smile on my face. And uh, I think I'll leave that there for now. I think there's room for nuance and room for there to be a little bit of an arc where maybe he's sad about doing that kind of stuff because, uh, well, anyway, I'll just let it evolve naturally, so I will stop talking now and uh, move on to the next question that I had, uh, which is, uh, is Let Me Be the Last Victim, which is the amazing quote from Hongo uh, this episode, is that the ethos of Common Rider? I kind of think it is. Um, <sighs> There's a lot going on in the world right now. Uh, some people think it's justified to hurt other people because you've been hurt or because someone you don't know has been hurt. And I think if you think that through, you will see that it is not true. It is not just to attack uh, person B because person A did something to person C and you're person Z. Or even if you're person E or F. It doesn't matter. Um, and... I love that Hongo takes this, you know, tragedy, you know, what has befallen him, and uh, he takes the idea that he doesn't want to let anybody else become a victim or remain a victim of Shocker's plans. Like, that's what's fueling him. See, and I guess I, that's why I don't think Hongo's just out for revenge, or I don't think that's what's motivating him. I think what's motivating him is truly an altruism and a care for other people, and he personally knows the stakes of what it means to be taken over by Shocker, and, I mean, if the world domination is, you know, I guess let me reverse it this way, you know, being abducted, having your body forcibly changed, and then becoming, you know, a mindless servant to them, 
or you know, short of that, having your mind, but still having your body have been altered by Chagger is such a dramatic thing. It's it's completely changed his life. And beyond that, if they're allowed to keep doing that, they're going to uh, do much worse to people. What what do you think the world will look like when Shocker has taken over? Uh, that kind of world, Hongo refuses to let form, and because of that, he will fight and he will put his life on the line every single time that he finds Shocker doing something. Not necessarily because of their evil, but because of the evil, like, because they have evil intentions, but because they do evil things, and because of the evil that they've done, the evil that they're doing in the moment, and because he doesn't want anyone to be victim to that evil. And it's because of how he cares and how he wants to preserve life and protect people from that, that that's the motivation. I, I feel like that's where he's acting from. Um, I feel like I've made this analogy before. Uh, uh, Himura Kenshin in Rurouni Kenshin at one point uh, is faced with this life or death decision this life or death situation uh, in order to well do something important and uh, isn't his life always on the line? Shh! It's very specific in the, in this one part of the show or, or the story where he has to choose to live. He has to choose to want to live and to fight to live and to fight for the lives of others as opposed to fighting to kill because he started as an assassin, his point was to murder people, and uh, he was right that a, a sword is a weapon to kill people, and that that's the reality he was grounded in, that's the truth, that's one very strong aspect of the truth, but there's nuance to truth, and he chose to live a truth that his deadly sword could be wielded for the sake of protecting people, and that might cost people's lives, but as much as he could avoid it, he would do that. Now, uh, you know, Common Raider just kills the cyborgs who he fights. And uh, having seen modern Common Raider, especially things like Forze, it is beautiful how there's a redemptive aspect added on to Common Raider after the fact. But the truth of the matter is that that's what he does. Um, and especially this early Common Raider, and, you know, the original. And uh, there is, gosh. <laughs> there is a little bit... Well, I, I'm, I'm getting off my point about the ethos of Kamen Rider being that he won't let others be victimized. Uh, but I kind of even see Hongo destroying the cyborgs that Shocker makes as him freeing those people from their servitude, their slavery, uh, you know, their suffering at the hands of Shocker as well. And I think that's kind of interesting. But just... I'm going to keep going forward. Does consistently uh, Kamen Rider act in such a way that he's trying to make himself be the last victim of Shocker and how does that work and I guess what does that mean how does it form his actions um, it's a great line and I would like to see how it carries forward and I, I think I, I probably enjoyed that line before but it never really stuck with me like it has here and now so uh, anyway I, I thought that was really cool um, and I do think maybe, again, to repeat myself, I do think maybe that is the ethos of Kamen Rider, and uh, I would like that to be, because I think that's a really great, um, it's a great driving spirit uh, behind, uh, like, a superhero property, a science fiction thing, too. Um, really anything. I think it's really great. So, with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and close out the episode. I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> I love this to be continued. Uh, at the end of all the episodes. I, I had first seen this, I think, on Evangelion uh, is where I noticed it. I don't know if the Ultraman shows have it or not, but um, anyway, that's it's neat. A uh, lot of fun. Makes it feel like the story is bigger and longer, uh, longer and you know, more ongoing and involved, which is a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I don't really think I have anything to say. Um, this was a really fun episode. Uh, it is weird that he, you know, just threw the Batman off the roof, and uh, he said "rider throw" this time. Uh, the the song says "rider jump, rider kick," but I don't know how far they got into production before they produced that song. I'll have to try to pay attention to it next time to see what episodes it has clips from in the beginning, because I think they shot almost all original footage for the opening song, so that could have been before production on the show started, maybe that was like the sizzle reel or whatever they call it these days, or if they had to make a pilot. I'd be interested to know like the actual production details of uh, of Common Rider. But, you know, first and foremost, I'm going to watch the show and enjoy that because I am.
<laughs> okay, sorry about the jump there. I had a uh, interruption, and you can hear banging because you know things are things are getting busy. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, trying to take the show episode by episode, and you know, really take it for what it is and what it's presenting, and try to leave as much of my baggage behind as I possibly can. Obviously, I brought some of it into this episode, but you know, I'm sure you can tolerate that, and you won't mind too much. Or I hope you won't. If you do, you know, let me know. Uh, I appreciate feedback, uh, but really, that's all I have to say for now. Uh, I really enjoyed this episode. I'm actually looking forward to the next episode because I like it a lot. Uh, it features, uh, you know, there was an episode preview. It features a scorpion man, and uh, I think it's one of my first, or one of my favorite episodes of, of the first bunch. A um, lot of interesting stuff there. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off, and uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. And, uh, gosh, I don't know what else to say. If you enjoyed this, like, comment, and share to help me grow. Don't forget to subscribe to keep current with each release. Chat with me on Twitter at MJ underscore scribe. Visit MJMunoz.com slash podcast to find the multiple feeds in which I analyze Star Wars, Tokusatsu, comics, and more. Visit MJMunoz.com slash support for links to my Redbubble and coffee pages so you can help keep me doing the things I do. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Until next time, be well. And remember, you don't have to shout henshin to be a hero.